mobility, purpose, art. Feet, skin, lungs, heart. Summer, adventure. Ice, nice. That's a poem called Outside. Composed by you, Aaron? Yes. Beautiful list of things that are outside. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I am slowly forgetting how to write poems on this Perhaps. podcast. But anyway, that's to commemorate a good semester, I think. I'd like to think. And today is the final episode of our nature journey. And I've written on my page, Nature 16, the end. Finally. Because <laughs> as we were saying this week, it feels like we've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Which is not to say it's felt like a bad thing. It just feels like it's it's been a very long discussion. Mm. Understandably, given that the solo scene is a beautiful, sustainable, tactile future, and really nature and sustainability are inextricably linked. That's that's very well said. And it's kind of frustrating well, because when I was preparing for this week's episode, I just kept coming up with things. I was like, oh, we never talked about that. We never <laughs> talked about that. And when you think about it, when you really think about it, I know this is insightful. Nature's big, and it's hard to talk yeah. about <laughs> in just 16, 16 hours or so. Mm -hmm. But today we're kind of wrapping it up, I think, with some fun exercises. As the title implies, we're kind of doing an overview of the solo scene itself through the lens of biomimicry. What we have done is broken up society into seven, seven, I think, very vague facets. There, there, there are more than that, obviously, but we just chose seven for the sake of brevity and fun, and also because they, they kind of align in part with past and future solo scene semesters, which we thought was cool. And we're just looking to nature for inspiration and saying, this should be like that. Kind of like on one episode you said, the solo scene library should be like a beehive. And we never questioned it. Perhaps we should have mm. one of the wilder things that you've said. But before we get into the heart of the discussion, Alicia has some things she would like to say about the solo scene zines. Each semester, we make a zine <laughs> to accompany. And as Aaron said, it's hard to cover all of nature in 16 hours. But we managed to do it in 16 pages, or wow. however many pages it is. I think it is. But we made a zine that is a small collection of our artwork that's in air quotes for anyone watching on YouTube, and writing and interpretations of how nature will be different in the solo scene, mainly being less polluted yeah. and a bit more accessible. And I encourage you, if you would like to support, well, the nature zine, you can support Eco Justice, which is a climate justice organization, or if you buy the other two zines, you support the podcast, which is really lovely because we love making it and enjoy having some support for it. So you can check that out in the link in the description. Moving on. So we want to start with one of the seven facets, which is aesthetics. Yeah. So this is quite vague, but what organism or natural mechanism did you take inspiration from for the aesthetics of the solo scene? Well, this is kind of a preface for the other six facets because mm -hmm. I think I probably chose them in a more abstract aesthetic um, initial, like sense then you probably thought things through a little bit more than I so and my new catchphrase I'm trying to incorporate into my vocabulary is it's a vibe oh. as you know I'm trying to become a little bit more um Emma Chamberlain yeah so mm -hmm. it's a vibe I think <laughs> and um the aesthetic is dinosaur time oh. specifically the Mesozoic era mm -hmm. which I think is something like 250 to 66 million years ago something like that not that I have recently looked at it um <laughs> And what do you think I find so appealing about this era? The sandiness. It was very sandy, did you say? Wild? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the, I think the wildness is really cool. I just think, obviously, there's not going to be, like, giant creatures roaming around in the solar scene, probably. Mm -hmm. But I like the vibe of, like, it's a vibe. If you, went back to the, <laughs> if you went back to the Mesozoic era, it would be like a theme park. It would be so fantastical and so wild. There'd obviously be an element of danger, but it, in the solo scene, I'll phrase it more like adventure. There's fun, and there's like, wow, what's that fern? Oh, it's trying to grab my leg. Like, there's just like wild stuff. There's mm -hmm. a screeching eagle above, and this very long-necked thing that's reaching for an ancient pear on the top branch of a tree. And um, wonder. Wonder is good. Yeah. Yes. And also. Everything in the Mesozoic era, 
was a lot newer than it is today. Mm. When you think about it, it was fresher. It was fresher earth. It's true. Yeah. I like that idea. For mine, I said one specific species of bird who is called the Vegelkop bowerbird. <laughs> and <laughs> basically, it's not even after the bird. It's after the homes that they make. Okay. Because in the solo scene, things will be functional and beautiful. And of course, natural. So given that this is a bird, they're not using cement to make their houses. Mm. They're using twigs. And they make a three by five foot dome. So like pretty big. Could fit a small child in it. And they decorate their front lawns with leaves, with shiny beetle shells. What else do they use? Flowers. And it's very simple. It's very cottage core in okay. the aesthetic. But I picture even if people are living in cities, that their homes will be a bit more, like a lot more pride in them, the way that these birds take pride in their homes. Sure. And I think the aesthetic will leak into other parts of society. So like things will be not just all natural and foraged, foraged but they'll be collecting beetle body parts, similar to these birds, meaning... The beetle body parts to me represent technology. Okay. Even if <laughs> they're very natural, obviously. But I feel like these birds are doing this explicitly just for the sake of the beauty of it, which is very solacine. So not just making it sustainable and earthy, but making it beautiful as well. And clearly, tactile. Of course. They're, are they doing it with their beaks or with their little claws? Both. Okay. Did yeah. you watch any vids? No, I just looked at a lot of pictures. <laughs> so you can look them up, get inspiration for your next interior design project. Lovely. So on the topic of housing, we should talk about the solar scene housing. Mm -hmm. And I went for the coral reef Ooh. because of its zoosanthelia bacteria. Love them. No, not for that reason. Because um, I just think if we must have urbanization and population density, which we must, and mm -hmm. you know, it can be a lot cooler than it is, um, it should feel more life-giving rather than soul-sucking that I feel it, it is in most places today. Like, it doesn't have to be so geometric mm -hmm. and prison-like. I was talking to you this week about a news story I saw where I think it was in the UK. There was, like, a big um, unveiling of a... They had, like, repurposed an old prison into housing. And I was like, this, like that just says it all. It's kind of mm -hmm. it's a sad thing. But I think coral reefs, if you look at the start of, let's say, Finding Nemo, we have to say that, they are um, such joyous and colorful places. And but everyone's got their little nook. They're bustling. But there is also a sense of, I won't say privacy. I mean, of course, like it's housing. So it's like there's always going to be privacy. But like um, just a mutual respect, I feel, mm -hmm. between, between the people. And also, let's think about what is outside of the coral reef. Like so much space. You don't see really coral reefs as far as the eye can see i think in every direction in every like three-dimensional direction there are very quickly like and fish just swim out so quickly and just explore the seas it's not a literal metaphor none of, of mine course. are but it's an inspiration i like that and coral reefs those are those are important ecosystems and i realize we barely spoke about them at all i think we just did one episode about underwater things so <laughs> it would have been nice because do you know the estimated global value of coral reefs each year I don't know. Six trillion T pounds. What? Yeah, UK pounds. Well. Because I think they do such because besides the obvious for like fisheries and biodiversity, they are crucial for limiting the waves that strike coasts. Mm. So pretty good. And also it just reminds me of a campus. But something about coral reef reminds me of a fish campus. Yeah. School of fish. It's true. That's probably where the name comes from. <laughs> um, speaking of fish campus, the organism of the week is an organism, but they create these community nests. So it's another type of bird, and it's called, can everyone see it here? Yes. The social weaver. So it is, it's a pretty like standard looking bird. It's just brown and black. Can I describe it though? Oh yeah. Because sure. the way you've, dis you've drawn it reminds me of a criminal bird. It does have a little black mask. Let's say, yeah. I don't know, there's like an animated movie called like Birds in the Slammer. It's about criminal birds going to jail. This guy would be like, jail bird. You know that term? Mm. That's what he looks like because he has a black like rubbery mask on. Yeah. And a crooked leg that he got 
like from some altercation with the, <laughs> with, with the law enforcement. Okay. <laughs> anyway, social weavers are endemic to Southern Africa. They build large compound community nests, which I just didn't know existed. The birds themselves are 14 centimeters tall. They have a black chin, black bared flanks, and a scalloped back. In each nest, there can be a hundred pairs of birds living in it. And here is my artistic interpretation of the nest. So it looks like a hay bale was like blown into a tree. Then there were holes kind of burrowed out of it. So if anyone's watching on YouTube, you can um, see that or perhaps just look up a picture. Just imagine a giant gem that has like a bunch of dust on it. That's yeah. why we just kind of draw it in so, the tree. <laughs> the nests span generations. So like maybe the grandpa birds work together to make the nest. And a hundred years later, they're still living in it. They're offspring. And other species sometimes use the nest. So it's like communal housing. So it's like they build it, but they're like, okay, fine. You guys can come in and mate or nest or lay your eggs in here too. Some snakes and reptiles will live in the nest too. That Um, doesn't sound very good. No, it's not. So they get in and they... (laughs) They're going to eat the eggs. It has one of the highest yeah, predatory uh, (laughs) rates of 70% of eggs are eaten. And... In fact, that's not a good argument for the communal housing. So this isn't my housing. Um, this isn't what I think the solar scene housing should be like. Okay. But it was just interesting. Um, I feel like the social weavers are kind of taken advantage of in many, many ways. Because other birds will build their nests nearby and rely on the social weavers' alarm call. So like they'll call out if there's a predator coming and all the other birds will kind of vacate the area. So they just they do a lot for the community. They eat mainly insects, and because they're in such a dry climate, they don't really drink water. They just eat the insects and get the water from them. Okay. And they eat some bark and leaves, and that's about it. I just think they're cool. Fair enough. Yeah. But for housing, I chose the beehive because, as you know, it's my favorite natural structure. And I just like the walls are made of beeswax. Yeah. Every time I see you, you're, like, absentmindedly at a desk with a notepad and I think you're working but then when I when you go away <laughs> I look through the pages and you've just been drawing hexagons for <laughs> hours and hours that's not true but it does seem characteristic of me I just love beehives or as they're called in the wild bee nests which I don't like hives has been stolen by the beekeepers would you ever be a bee beekeeper 100% because you can technically I don't know if it's legal in Montreal but in some places you can get them kind of put them on your window and you have to cut a hole in the glass, though I don't think you can do that on a rental, but have the bees kind of coming through your walls into an indoor beehive. That doesn't sound nice. I like the idea. <laughs> but anyway, I like that the houses are multifunctional, but obviously aesthetically very pleasing. So the little compartments, the hexagons, can be used for laying eggs, for the larva to kind of... Larvate? Per- yep, and then turn into pupae. And... They're used for storing pollen, for sleeping. Obviously, the queen bee has her own peanut-shaped holes that she lives in. Okay. And, yeah, I just really like them. Seinfeld's movie made it seem like quite a depressing place to live, though. Mm. That's the capitalist hive. Yes. We're going to go for the, the organic hive. But, yeah, I like them. And I also like that they, they're not often built hanging the way they're always depicted in cartoons. They usually will, like fit into like a hole in a tree, and if you look up pictures of naturally occurring beehives, they look so cool because it's like there's a tree and then there's just kind of these bright yellow hexagons kind of poking out, or in rocks or things yeah. like that. And I just really like how they fit themselves into the natural environment very seamlessly mm. and unintrusively. Like they're not hurting the, they're not like burrowing out a hole in the tree to live. It's just like they find a hole and then build the beehive there. I think we could take some inspiration for that. That's cool. So they're just, it's a vibe. They are just fitting themselves into the natural landscape Mm -hmm. wherever seems best. Yeah, and it's compact. So it's not like they're sprawling. They each have their own nest or their own Mm -hmm. beehive. Like they all live together in community. Have you ever eaten honeycomb? I don't think so. I don't think I've ever eaten it either. I feel like I would really like it though. Mm. Um, The next facet, let's talk about communication. And I wanted to be representative of many different kingdoms of nature and different like scopes. So we had the dinosaur. I was more referring to the whole era itself. 
And of course, then we had, we went under the sea for the coral reef. Now we're going deep within to inside the human body. That's Ooh. like the cells of the human body is what yes. I'm saying for communication. Because this is something that always just amazed me when I, when we first started learning about like how cells work and proteins, ribosomes, ATP, that kind of thing in high school and still continue to amaze me through university and even like this week when I've been trying to learn more about why cells and how they know what to do. However many times I read the description about its chemical signaling and things like mm -hmm. it just I don't buy it because it just seems so sentient that it is amazing to me and I like that sense of mystery that I still have for it and what I like about this and how I think human communication should or can take note from it is the way that everybody has a purpose like every little cell if you remember the diagrams from high school biology it would be like one of them picks up something and goes on a little crane and then drops it off at this other place and they all just kind of do it intuitively I mean I think it's because they're like programmed to do so or chemicals or whatever mm -hmm. um, but there is there's just a sense of efficiency with it and a sense of purpose that I think we lack today in our communication where it's like maybe I'll send a meme mm. and something else that we were talking about yesterday is in really big houses where people have PAs yeah and they like call their children down for dinner like through a microphone in their room and we were like this seems a little bit off and let's say in the old days I'm not sure if this ever actually happened, but in like steampunk architecture, where it's like you can send a, a message in like a pipe that mm -hmm. reaches their room. And today, obviously, you can just text or maybe use Alexa. I don't know, like that idea, but I'm sure you can do it. And this just seems like the opposite of that. It's so close quarters with the cells. And I think that's, that's lovely. It's like a relay. I like that. A relay of information. Also, do you know what PA means? Do you know what that stands for? No. Public address system. Oh, yeah. interesting. Now you know. You're yeah. probably going to forget, but now you know. I know. Maybe it'll be on the quiz later. For me, I chose the mycelium network of trees, which I've talked about on the nature series before. But again, it's, to me, the best natural communication system. It was funny. I was reading a bit about how scientists were attempting to translate the signals that these fungi can send over these long fungal strings basically is how they're described um into language like they would take the chemical signals and kind of mark them onto these like frequency sh okay. charts kind of like when you look at a podcast it goes up and yeah. down um, and it said they use 15 but upwards of 50 words so it's like it is very codified the way that they send signals it's not just like yeah a thousand different things it's like they have a language basically and this network connects most trees in the world underground within the top 10 centimeters of soil all over the earth total there is 450 quadrillion kilometers of this network just in the top 10 centimeters of soil around the world do you want to know how big 450 quadrillion kilometers is half the milky way so that's how many kilometers of this fungal network connect trees and other plants and it can send chemical signals from one tree to another of like, hey, there's an infection. Hey, there's an infestation. Or, guys, we need some help reproducing. Can you send some seeds our way <laughs> on the wind, basically? And they can communicate like that, but they also can exchange water, nitrogen, other nutrients um, amongst each other. So it's like one would send a signal to other saying, guys, there's a drought over here, and they would send water their way, which is really crucial in dry climate that's how the trees or plants can survive but they can also send antibodies so this forest maybe they succumb to a disease but they can send out the antibodies to other organisms to then fortify themselves against it and that's how it was originally discovered so crazy yeah and i think the reason i chose this is because it's not just the dissemination of information like it's not just the language it's the exchange of the symbiotic exchange of nutrients and like, okay, obviously they could store up the water for themselves in this network. They're choosing to transport it to other people. And I think we could use technology or communication 
systems a bit more amicably than we currently do. It's sometimes just used for, as you were saying, it's going to send a meme. Like, it's kind of mindless. It's not with any purpose behind it. Yeah. It's certainly not to, like, make the world a better place the way that these networks seem to be doing. I think we can learn a lot from it. And it's like, obviously, these fungi who are living in the network doing all this work, they are getting water and carbon dioxide that the trees are fixing into the soil. But they're providing the trees with 90% of their phosphorus and 80% of their nitrogen. So it's like the trees just could not exist without this network, which is really crazy to me because you think of trees as such powerful centennial beings, whereas, no, they need the support of the community underground and above ground. I feel like we can learn from that. So what about when you grow a tree just like in a pot or in a garden that hadn't previously had trees in it? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I don't know too much about That's it. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Um, transportation is next. Mm -hmm. And going from, well, I suppose you just talked about the Milky Way, so it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's topical because I wanted to reference the raw power of orbits, mm. comets, asteroids, these gravitational mechanisms which move the huge celestial bodies in a way we cannot even fathom the scale mm. and sometimes the speed. And so I think for our transportation, we can take inspiration from that. So gravity, magnets. Well, it's magnets. It's like using harnessing. I'm just, mm. I put that in quotation marks, harnessing, because I feel like it's always... It's going to be a lot of harnessing. A lot of thing. harnessing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like in Interstellar, the movie, mm -hmm. they do a gravitational slingshot. Mm -hmm. which I always thought, remember that? Yeah. I was like, that's so cool. They're harnessing. Or if you think about like a ski lift that's down, downwards mm -hmm. and maybe it harnesses the power of a stream to mm. kind of ferry you down like that. I see. What of harnessing? Yeah. I like that. Thank you. I feel like you're really passionate about this well it's like it's also you know it's it's a beautiful like when you see it in motion like when you see like an animation of all the planets moving or when you look up and it's like there's mars and then it's because we're tilting it's like you know it looks like it's moving across the sky and i think right now our transportation is probably uglier than it's ever been yeah so true. i think the, the the beauty of it like the simplicity it's like how many colors do each of these planets have Usually just one, maybe two, mm. except ours is like four, but most mm -hmm. of them, I mean. I see. And that's cool. Yeah, it is cool. Transportation, I picked two things, but one of them equally passionate, the other less so. So the first one I chose is pollen, because pollen just moves however it can. Yes. Do you know the, the levels in Super Mario Galaxy where he kind of floats on the wind on mm -hmm. a little, he's like pollen man. Yeah. That's transportation. Yeah. It's transporting himself. Exactly. And I don't think we should be harnessing the wind in that way of just like hopping on wind streams. But it's like the pollen, if there's not many mammals around, they're not going to be relying on like the way the burdocks cling onto fur and then are moved. Like they're going to find a different mechanism. Maybe it's the wind. Maybe it's by being carried through a stream mm -hmm. or eaten by an animal the way the like berries do and stuff. But they find a way that makes sense for the area. This is obviously a theme in mine. But it's like adapting to the area you're in for transportation. It's like stop trying to build roads where it doesn't make any sense to have roads. And it would be more logical to have canals like Venice or something like that. And yeah, just be logical about it. Don't try and fit a square peg into a round hole the way that I feel like we tend to do. And my second one, you know my favorite transportation idea, tunnels. Right, I can see it on your page that... You kind of spelt it wrong, but I'm going to let that slide. <laughs> so prairie dogs build underground towns and then networks. I've seen them in a wildlife reserve in Nova Scotia, and they just kind of... Or no, it wasn't Nova Scotia. It was, it was in England. Where we saw these prairie dogs or yeah, like meerkats I remember. popping up, and they just have yeah these underground it was like networks. like whack-a-mole. Exactly. And I just think it's wonderful, and I think tunnels are really logical for cold climates or very precipitation heavy climates 
so people can choose active forms of transport, walking or biking, and not have to worry too much about yeah. the Yeah. Imagine elements. if there was a cycling city underneath Montreal. Yeah. How cool would that be? I mean, there's a metro, but mm-hmm. forget about that. <laughs> I think metros are cool, too. And it doesn't make sense for everywhere. Like, some places have a lot of bedrock, so it wouldn't make any sense to build tunnels. But they could be above-ground tunnels as well, so just, like, covered walkways. And I think we can take inspiration from the prairie dogs. The next two I have, I'll lump them together because they're the two artificial ones I have. Mm -hmm. So it's food and politics. And for food, I chose a farm. Okay. Which is kind of stretching the limits of nature a little bit, but Mm -hmm. it's outside, so I'm going to count it. Okay. And this is because of the empathy, because I think, like, when you think of food or, like, problems of the world or how to design food, you think about making it more equitable Mm -hmm. so it's like you don't have the obese people here the starving people here but then when you look at nature i know you talked about the mycelium network but for the most part it is not equitable like that like there isn't that kind of empathy like when you look at a forest it's like some things get light some things don't and they die but some things get maybe more light than they ever needed to survive and so they grow really big that's just how it is and i think um in terms of like economics it's it's more about um trying to counter that as best we can Mm. so i think it's a bit of a a a tangent but when people talk that down entirely to capitalism i think it's a little bit of a fallacy you could say that maybe it um exaggerates or extenuates this natural phenomenon that's my opinion Mm. but with farms it's like i was thinking about farmed plants not so much farmed animals but i think it's also the case for them everything gets its own spot every seed and they all get pretty much the same amount of water because it's quite uniform and the same amount of sunlight. And it's like almost, mm. I know that like farms still get like a bum strawberry, but for the most part, it's Honestly, all good. that's really an incredible metaphor for society at large. Thank you. The plants being treated equally. Yeah, I don't I mean, I don't want to think about us being farmed because obviously the end of the lettuce is life and it gets picked and eaten. But, mm. but like it's growing there. It's quite a fair. Yeah. Quite a fair time. I like that. For food, I chose the sea slug, obviously. I want humans to be able to photosynthesize, but also still be able to eat. And these are the slugs that basically, they're called kleptoplastics, and they absorb the chloroplasts of other photosynthesizing organisms and kind of incorporate them into their cells. Apparently, they're not born with the chloroplasts in their cells. I always thought that they were, it was like somewhere along the line, the chloroplast got absorbed and then was passed on just like within the the cell. But it, pretty sure it's something that yeah. happens as soon as they're born i talked about this with a species of salamander mm. during the semester remember yeah you don't remember i do well <laughs> and yeah i think that would be cool i think eating is wonderful and a great part of the human experience but it'd be cool if we could somehow fo- like harness photosynthesis perhaps even to generate food harness yeah harness so photosynthesis. You're, to generate food not not, not necessarily to have it in our cells so isn't that the, what we do when we grow plants though yeah it is <laughs> but i mean more like capturing food out of thin air right okay and making it happen yeah like making it grow out of thin air which i suppose is exactly what happens when you grow vegetables <laughs> but anyway um that sounds a lot like something i would say on this podcast and i'm yeah. kind of proud not to have been the one to say that because i don't know i don't know how well it holds up but politics is the next facet that we want to talk about and for me, I harkened back again to a previous episode and referenced the bonsai garden. Mm. Because, again, it's like the artificial one. That's why I lumped these two together. Mm-hmm. Um, bonsai, one of the main tenets of it is that it represents a wider landscape only on a micro form. And I think mm-hmm. that's what politics should do. It should be representative yeah. of the people. Our skin color, our opinions, our ages, all this kind of thing. And um, there's also in bonsai, it's like, there is a certain tranquility, mm-hmm. there's a care, there's almost a sacred zen-like feel when you're in those kind of places that I think our city halls and civic centers should have that maybe maybe now it's it's widely seen as like, oh, politics, that's a circus. And mm-hmm. it's like maybe federal politics are because it's televised and it's like dramatized and it's twitterized. But I think politics, we should think of it a little bit more lowercase p, local politics just like some person pruning the world in their backyard and mm. back garden and that's what uh that's what bonsai is yeah yeah there's something about how how natural it looks but also how kind of 
heightened mm. a practice it feels like yeah very civil civic civil yeah meticulous bonsai oh also something about the accessibility of it because despite that heightened zen like um aura that i was talking about i feel like walking into a japanese style garden is somehow you're more at ease than you are walking into let's say an english country garden where it's like everything is so geometrically pruned yeah you're afraid to like step on the grass yeah there's, there's a certain fear or trepidation there whereas not so much with bonsai because mm. you want to touch little things you know yeah. like there's, there's also a playfulness to it there's a softness to it yeah for sure for my politics or community structure is kind of what i was thinking it of um i jokingly said ants because you talked about how ants last week it was like the men are just disposable flying, disposable and the women do all the work but that was a joke um, so I, I know it's not a joke, <laughs> and I know that behind every joke there's a piece of truth. So you just outed yourself as a radical feminist on on this podcast. I heard um, a few days ago about in the seventies, women were just setting up women camps, basically where they would all go and live away from society. And my real choice was fish, just schools of fish. Yeah. Because they move in the same direction at the same speed, and they turn simultaneously. And I don't think we need a hive mind in our politics, but I think we need a bit more pulling in the same direction it's like maybe we of course we'll disagree of how to get there but it's like the end goal should just be equitable food or equitable access to education should be the solar scene should be the solar scene paint yeah <laughs> you're welcome politicians yeah but right now it's like well some people think that there's this a pri- this is a priority and so on but i feel like with the level of psychological and medical research that we have at our disposal it should be able to just like prioritize it very um yeah. objectively so not being like, well, I feel like this is it's like objectively, if we got the food system mm. sorted out, then the education system would follow and so on. I think like, that's the hope with AI, yeah. singularity, things like Ugh. this. So you're thinking of that scene in Finding Nemo where they ask for directions and the fish are all pointing as one. Yeah. Even though I think they do like a question mark or something like that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, <laughs> that's nice. The final facet is education. And I left this one to last because I'm most proud of it. And also it might have been the semester that I think I was most proud of. Like, yeah. I know we're supposed to say it was a nature one, but I really like this one too. But I just, mm-hmm. I look back fondly on those education days and also the zine. I really like that zine too. Um, so <laughs> my inspiration from nature for how the solar scene education should be is rocks. Mm. And what I took from these is their worldliness. Yeah. I want to... Salt of the earth. Real salt of the earth. They just... <laughs> 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 the cockney rock. I feel like... Um, Dumb as a rock. That's an insult, right? Yeah. So we need to reclaim this because why would a rock be dumb? Just because it doesn't talk? Silence is ignorance? Mm-hmm. No, my friend. I think quite often rocks have a, a, a kind of stoic wisdom in their silence. Mm. Think about how much they've seen more than you can imagine. Because when you think about a rock, how old is it? Who knows? As old as the earth. Yeah. Effectively, because it's like, a, you know, the closed matter or whatever. So maybe it came out of a volcano. And then it just landed underwater for like 300 million years. And it just chilled there and mm-hmm. thought. It was like a meditation, um, like a monastery, mm-hmm. just alone with its thoughts. And then it comes back up to see the world. And maybe now it's a road. And every time it gets driven over, it's just <laughs> growing its its opinion on how the transportation system should be. It's just like the, that feeling of observation. Mm. And of we don't always have to be talking. I know this is ironic because we have a podcast, but it's like sometimes just listening, that's the best way to learn. Mm-hmm. And I think rocks listen very well. And also I was thinking we should talk about rocks next week, question mark, even though we're not in the nature semester anymore. Just like the rock rocks, segment? Just like a rock episode. Okay. We don't have to, but it's just an idea. Yeah, or we can have a segment called the sedimentary segment. Okay, we'll I know see. you. You're feeling your wordplay a little bit too much these days. But I keep forgetting words too, it's a vibe. so it's balanced. It's a vibe. Um, it's funny that you chose rocks because I also chose something to represent that we don't need to talk so much, and I just said all animals, which is obviously quite a cop out. Yeah. But animals learn through observation and through experience, and I feel like when we're educating humans. We rely on language. So it's like until kids are four or even older and they can read, it's like we feel like, oh, they can't really learn anything because obviously they don't have the language for us to communicate with them, them to communicate with us. They can't read things. They can't ask questions. But really, it's when they're learning the most. Exactly. And we need to incorporate them into things like, hey, we're going to go together and we're going to dig this hole. 
and then they'll learn how to use a shovel, find motor skills, all these different things. But like as it is, we'd be like, well, no, we can't really, they don't understand it. Yeah. So I think observation and experience are really great, not just for kids, but for adults too. Because right now, if you try and learn a language as an adult, it's like you're sitting there reading and reading and reading this stuff, but it's relying on a limited language. But if you have the experience and kind of just let your brain absorb things through immersion, mm. it's like a bit more, I think it would be a bit more natural. And maybe language isn't a great example, but it was a skill. I think it is. You're going to get some cuts and bruises, just like the deer taking its tiny Bambi to the, mm-hmm. the watering hole with it. Yeah. And maybe gets scratched by some brambles and it learns like, oh, we have to avoid those guys. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's like we can rely on language, but I don't think language is the best way of educating. You read a recipe and you're like, yeah, cool. But until you actually make the recipe and realize, oh, the butter is going to separate if you pour it into something cold. So you need to temper it or whatever. It's like these things you need to learn through experience is really nothing else. And I think we can just look to nature for that. Look to rocks. Look to Maybe rocks. even more so than animals. Just my mm-hmm. opinion there. I think you won out on most of those, but I'm sticking by rocks for the education. Cool. So the next section in today's episode is mostly kind of a silly send-off for the semester, mm-hmm. which is... <laughs> Let's play God. Let's invent something (laughs) in nature that we wish existed. We've talked before about bringing back things that are extinct or bringing back practices that have gone by the wayside. This is more like put on your fantasy cap and what do you wish existed? You said you were very proud of yours, so I'll mention mine first so that yours gets the, the cool spot. I came up with three. A threat, a food, and a companion. Cool. So for the threat... It's called the inertia microbe, a.k.a. city slicker virus. So it's obviously a tiny microbe that um, gives you a headache if you sit still for too long. It's kind of like a balancing mechanism in this video game called uh, trying to escape the technological matrix. And the way you defeat this is by movement and sweat. Cool. Sleep doesn't count, but it's basically just a way to get people off the couch. Mm -hmm. That's myself included. That's... uh, that's the, the inertia microbe. And then for a food, do you want to guess what I chose? The savory snack. Pretty much. It's called uh, flesh grass. <laughs> Is it warm? No, no, no. Okay. It's just like it's, it has a fleshy texture to it. Mm. So it grows in strips. Yeah. I was picturing the snack being kind of like um, beef jerky. Yeah. But it's, it's a plant. And it's savory. And it kind of, it has the texture like you can rip it, like it tears. Mm -hmm. Like, you know how mango is like that? Yeah. But it's dry. It's not like wet like a fruit. Okay. We should try and, I've never tried it, but I've heard that jackfruit is like that. Yeah. Plantains, they they kind of have a similar vibe to it as well. Mm -hmm. Very savory. But I want it to feel like fulfilled. Yeah. Retweet this episode if you agree with me. We're not on Twitter, but do it anyway. And then for a companion, this is called the snorkel bear a.k.a. Eurasian Quimbley. And it is three to... <laughs> the Latin name and everything. Yeah, it is uh, three to four feet tall. And they're so named the snorkel bear because their face slash snout kind of curls up like that. Snorkel. Yeah, uh, like an anteater. Mm. Even though theirs goes down, I think. Whatever. Um, the lifespan about 15 to 20 years. So it's like, it's a good compa- companion for you. Mm. And they're vegetarian, like pandas. They're very strong. Um, house trainable. So mm-hmm. they're like, they can use the bathroom. Picture how tall these guys are. Yeah, they can walk on, on two feet or on four, like a bear. Um, and they love to wrestle. Oh. So that's what this is. Because I was thinking about like pets, like what kind of animal friend would I like to have? And obviously dogs is the main thing. And I love dogs. But one of the things with dogs, most, most breeds, I think, and most individuals, is that beyond, once they grow out of their puppy stage, you lose kind of that physicality where they're like... Mm. I mean, there's a lot of dogs who love to play, but not often are they playing with you, like kind of wrestling with you or like, mm. you know, doing that kind of thing. So I think this kind of thing, it would just, it would be really fun to like wrestle one. This is inspired by your insomnia last night when you were saying, I need something to wrestle with. Like, I need to get this energy out. You <laughs> yeah. wish you had a snorkel. A snorkel bear, yeah, aka Eurasian Quimbley. Mm-hmm. Um, there's two different varieties. One's all beige and one is like a dark red. Okay. That was just, I don't know why I thought of that. Yeah, there has to be two. <laughs> um, that's funny. Which one would you want? Would you want one of these first of all? Of course you would. Sounds creepy. No, it'd be soft. It's like a giant <laughs> teddy bear. But okay. they're very strong also. But like they're vegetarian, the so they're not going to come for you. Mm. You want the red one? Yeah. So if you stain it, it wouldn't. 
yeah, the page, if you spill some grape juice on it, <laughs> might not be, <laughs> might not work. Okay, my organism is kind of similar to your first one, so I feel less cool now because okay. you invented three. Sure. But mine is called the single-use plastic flies. So they're like fruit flies. Yes. And you know how fruit flies seem to just spawn out of nowhere when you have the rotten fruit? Right. And they will instantly force you to get rid of the rotten fruit yes. because you're like, I don't want these around. I don't want them to multiply. With the plastic flies, it doesn't have to be just single use, but the plastic flies, we'll call them. They are basically to deter anyone from undercutting any government regulations <laughs> of like no plastics. Okay. Because it's like, okay, there's always going to be the person who's like, well, plastic's cheaper. I'm going to do it. And so someone buys this plastic object and then instantly out of who knows where. I was trying to research where they come from and it's like, they're attracted to the smell. They can get in through tiny holes. And I'm like, but where are they coming from? Like the fruit flies. So this will just be the same mechanism they spawn. Um, perhaps from the depths of hell. Perhaps from... Yeah. Who knows? Well, the, the medieval theory was abiogenesis, right? Yeah. It's like they just arise from the rotting fruit. Yeah. Which I'm still not convinced that they don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm joking, but... I like this organism. That's a yeah. very fun idea. I think it's kind of telling that... Like, that's a good um, environmental one, right? Mm -hmm. Neither of us thought about, like, some just great carbon sequestering... Well, I thought thing. about that, but it's like, in the solo scene, there won't be as much... That's like, true. It'll that's be true. kind of fixed, but it's still... This is kind of a deterrent from doing it. And imagine how infested the factory would be. Because it would just be full of these yeah, flies. Yeah, it sounds like it would cause a lot of chaos. Though. That's the goal. It's like a biblical we'll plague. It. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. This, the plastic fly. So, I heard that you have a quiz for me, Aaron. Yes, of course. The real silly send-off for the nature semester. Mm -hmm. Going to quiz you. I think I've only done this one time before at the end of the degrowth semester. But I like it. I think we should do it at the end of every one, but we should like alternate. Okay. So next time you quiz me. This time, it's not just made up like the house points at Hogwarts. It's out of 52. Okay. So you have to try and pass. You have to try and get over 26. Okay. That's the goal. It's a quiz looking back at the semester. So listeners can play along at home if you want. You probably won't, but it's like everything here we have either said on the podcast or in the zine. So it's kind of like testing your memory and how much you really learn. Because one of the original ideas for the solo scene was this is like the university course that we never took. Mm -hmm. So how much are you actually learning? Yes. So there's 10 questions and the first one I'll ask is worth five points. Describe the solo scene. Solo scene is the beautiful, sustainable, tactile future where climate change has been resolved and society has established mechanisms to safeguard current and future generations' well-being. Give me some detail. Because that just sounds to me like you recited off our podcast description or on the Instagram bio or something like that. Oh my goodness. Give okay. me a vibe. It's a vibe. Lots of trees, no cars, bikes, houses that are authentic and cultivate joy and zest for life <laughs> the government is strong yet unobtrusive <laughs> and very motivated by the people okay. there are a network of natural parks that are easily accessible by train and people are encouraged and empowered to visit these areas as much as they desire and Workplaces are meaningful. <laughs> They're not just cogs. Cogs in a wheel. Okay. They are. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a four for that because I think it was it was quite good. You you definitely grew into it, okay. but as I said, it was a little bit unoriginal, and I was just looking for some flair. Okay, most of them are just factual questions, so I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> okay. Um. What's my favorite type of ecosystem? Oh my goodness. Your this favorite is worth three, three points. My favorite ecosystem is. Mine was bog. Yours? It's from Coral Reef? No. You probably invented something. No, I didn't. It was in the Yukon. The Yukon, like, boreal uh, wilderness forest thing. Is that actually your favorite? That's what I said in episode one. But is that actually your favorite? I fluctuate like any person. No. <laughs> I'd say nine times out of ten, you'd say coral reefs or something aquatic. 
Whatever. It was in that week I wanted to move to the Yukon. Do you remember? You're thinking of changing your name to Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What kind of leaf is included in the nature zine? Spoilers for people who haven't yet bought one. There's a maple leaf in the nature zine. Okay. That's three so points. So I went out and collected that. Uh, question four. This is worth ten. Because okay. there are ten possible answers and you just have to name as many as, as many you can. As can. Your favorite textures of nature. Also, I don't have the answers for these, so this one is in your book. Okay. But you can't look yet. I'll try and maybe take notes of them. Yeah. My favorite texture is cracking ice under your feet, under yes. your shoes. Yes, actually, I do have the most. Yeah, okay, that's one. <laughs> okay. I don't know why that's the first one that came to me. Um, Amber, like the yes. sticky stuff Tree on Tree resin. Trees. Yeah. Leaves that have lost their... Their leafness and there's kind of a leaf skeleton. Yes. Okay. That's one of them. Inside of a seashell. Yes. Oh. Time's ticking. Did I say like squelching mud? Mud, that's one of them. Yeah. The softness of flower petals? Nope. Biting snow. Yep, that was one of them. <laughs> I don't actually know. You could have had feeding an animal. Okay. Hot beach sand. I was about to say, oh, I should have said sand. A warm downpour. Okay. That's the most like Tumblr girl thing. Yeah. A birch bark. Mm-hmm. And cold dew. Cold okay. mountain dew. So that is five. five. Not too bad. Five out of ten. <laughs> okay, next one for three points. Eco justice. Mm-hmm. What was it originally called? Mm. I'll even give you most of it. The blank... Legal Defense Fund. I feel like Ecosystem. Sierra. The Sierra Legal Defense Fund. It's a Canadian thing. There's no Sierra <laughs> Desert in Canada. Shh. Okay, um, again for three points. What is the name for the study slash science of tree rings? Only a couple of weeks ago, my friend. Dentology? I'm going to give you one point for that. It's dendochronology. Oh, my goodness. I think that was pretty good. No, 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 no. Remembrance. No, no. Nope, no. no. Okay, next question for three. Are dinosaur bones real? No. Elaborate. They are molds that were left by the bone and filled in with calcium deposits. Nicely, nicely. Okay, that's three points. And for a bonus point, what do dinosaurs do or what did they do? It's so a one word answer. Roam. They did roam. <laughs> so that's four points for you. <laughs> what did dinosaurs do? Um, for three points again, what is the largest unit of geological time periods? So for instance, one of the smaller ones is sub epoch. I think era. Era is incorrect. What is it? The word you're looking for is eons. Oh. Eons is the biggest. Errors right underneath that. Fortunately, no points. Two questions left. Um, this one, you knew it was coming. Name as many organisms of the week <laughs> for the studied. semester as you can. And it's out of 16 points, so it largely renders a lot of the other ones irrelevant. I should have studied, but I felt like it was cheating, but I should have still done it. I don't think I'm going to get many of these. Okay, today's is called the Social Weaver. Yes. <laughs> Bonsai? Yes. I did the oldest tree, which is called the California... I'll, I'll take that as enough. Because <laughs> I can see this is going to be a struggle. Well, it's it's a lot of things going on here. You have done some underwater things. Did you do starfish? Yeah, I did a blue sea star. I'll give you okay. that. That's four. It's going to take me a while. I'm trying to wrap my brain for like four months worth of things. Did I? I didn't do seal. Should have done seal on that week. But I don't know yours. <laughs> I was hoping you would. But if you want to guess seal, 
you can check. We have ways of doing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a shame. So that's four. I'm not looking at it right now. Okay. I think I did the kangaroo. We were talking about it quite a bit. Yes, you did do the kangaroo. Yeah. Anyway, for mine, you could have had the Korok, the humble Korok, mm -hmm. the amethyst deceiver, the northern red anemone, the black ant, which was what I did last week, which you said was something made up, <laughs> uh, the mosquito, the rock hyrax, those small little mammals that slept in dog piles, mm -hmm. uh, the blue sea star, as you mentioned, and the only one I have written for you was the jackalope. Jackalope. Yeah, you should have okay. mentioned that. But anyway, five on that is a... Uh, Somewhat of a poor showing, and I don't think you can pass, but we'll ask this last question anyway. And this is a game of finish the line, finish the line from the poem. <laughs> so um, I'll start with today's. There's three of them, so you get one point for each. Summer, adventure, ice. Heart. Nice. Second one. I think that I shall never see. Oh, I'm lovely as a tree. Correct. And last one. Mr. Mosquito. Cheetah. <laughs> I'll give you half a point for that. It was lawful evil Cheeto. Mm. So my quick maths makes it look like you had 23 and a half. Okay. Not so not bad. so far off the pass. Something yeah. like 45%. Fair play. Hopefully people listening got slightly more. Probably not. But. I feel like the organisms, as I looked through my notes, were all so obscure this semester. Like I had yeah. petes, which I wouldn't what have. What is it? Petes, which is the thing that, the little microbe that eats plastic. Yeah. <laughs> and then I can't even, like the rest, they're all just kind of strange. I think it's because we were talking about organisms so much in segments outside of the organism of the week that yeah. it became a bit of a blur. It did. That's all right. We love talking about organisms. So thank you all for listening to the nature semester. You can follow along over the next few weeks as we do some fun, creative episodes, a couple get to know us episodes. I think it's going to be really enjoyable. And then tune in for the new semester before you know it. Bye. <laughs>